Good morning. Welcome to worship on a beautiful October day. We pray that this time together may fulfill you in a way that you can find nowhere else, that you experience the peace and the joy and the grace of Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. So again, welcome to worship. Many announcements in your bulletin this morning. I encourage you to read them more closely as the morning progresses and uh, in particular, many opportunities to serve. So check out your count me in form, uh, that insert in your bulletin, always opportunities listed there, including food for kids, which is a fill event, a food fill event that is coming up in just a couple of weeks. I know there is a table out in the gathering area where you could sign up to work one of the shifts uh, that uh, fill food for the hungry in our community and around the world, and many other opportunities as well. Next Sunday is Reformation Sunday, and so we encourage you, if you are so inclined, to wear red, which is the liturgical color uh, symbolizing the Holy Spirit. And we give thanks for the work of the Holy Spirit as it continues to transform and work in the midst of the church, the body of Christ. We will also ask your prayers for those uh, preparing to affirm their baptism next Sunday afternoon at 1.30 p.m., this is a, a congregational welcome uh, to the affirmation of baptism or confirmation service, so you are welcome to attend that, but ask that you keep those young ones in your prayers. Our spotlight for today features Muriel Tritton led our stalwart quil quilters for years, devoting much of her time at home to sewing quilt tops. One of her quilts and its story is on display in the gathering area. And the Bethel Rummage Sale this fall was a rousing success, earning more than $7,850. In addition, the leftover items were donated to support various other missions. So thank you for your contributions. And your pew racks today feature two helpful new resources. First, a reminder of the many methods of giving to Bethel. And second, a laminated card to place in the offering plate if you give electronically to Bethel. We are in the month of stewardship, and so Ryland Eichhorst will share a mission minute at this time on behalf of the stewardship team. Good morning. Grateful for the past, hopeful in the future is a theme for the 2019 Fall Stewardship Program supporting the 2020 Annual Fund and Mortgage Funds. The theme, Grateful for the Past, Hopeful in the Future, has been incorporated into Bethel's 150th anniversary celebration. The Stewardship Drive supports this theme in our program as we look forward to the next chapter of our congregation's ministry. Bethel's mission statement is, we, the Bethel congregation called by God, commit ourselves to proclaim the gospel and to prepare the members for outreach and service and to minister to human needs. Our theme verse, Jeremiah 29, verse 11, states, For surely I know that plans I have for you, says the Lord, to give you a future with hope. This past month, the stewardship campaign emphasized how we as a congregation can fulfill the mission statement at Bethel with supporting videos. If you haven't seen those videos, they are available for viewing on the Bethel website under Ministry and Stewardship on the drop-down menu. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7 says, God loves a cheerful giver, and we are in the midst of our monthly commitment weekends. As Pastor Anjanette said, we have a couple of ways for you to give. One is an envelope that is in your pew holder that you can fill out, you can mail it in, you can put it in the offering plate, or you can drop it off at the church office. There's also an electronic card for those that are like to use your mobile phone. There's opportunities to give by going to the Bethel website, which is BethelLutheran.org on the website, on the internet. Texting, or there's a mobile app that you can use by downloading a REAM, R-E-A-L-M, Connect app, which is the app used for Bethel Connect communication. In your pew holders, for those that are giving electronically, there's also a card that you can put in the offering plate each week. It says, I give online and I am thankful. The Stewardship Committee thanks you and invites you to join us this next weekend to celebrate Bethel's past and our commitment to future growth. There's a flyer in your bulletin. And next Saturday night, we'll have a pizza dinner with uh, uh, 
a salad tray and cookies for those that attend Saturday night. And on Sunday morning, we'll be serving pancakes from 8 till noon. Please join us to celebrate and remember God's blessings upon our efforts to fulfill our mission at Bethel. Thank you from the stewardship team, and may God bless our congregation. Thank you. Thank you, Rylan. We are called to worship by Sing for Joy. On this day, we hear of King David's greatest sins. Psalm 51 is thought to have been written by David after Nathan confronts him with his sin, and we use part of that psalm in confession. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner, when my mother conceived me. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me 
Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. We now sing a restoration using the next three verses of David's psalm. Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. God of forgiveness, you showed your servant David the error of his ways and forgave him his sins. Forgive us and help us to see how we might live differently to honor you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Oh. 
Today's reading is from the second Samuels, verses, or chapters 11 and 12. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, This is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Meanwhile, King David devised a plan A, plan B, and finally plan C to cover his sin. Plan C involved having Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, killed in battle. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Word of God, word of life. Children are welcome for the children's word. I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church together. The church is not a building, the church is not a steeple, the church is not a resting place, the church is a people. I am the church, you are the church. We are the church together. Well, it's not Halloween yet, but look what I have. Ooh, does somebody want any candy? Huh? Anybody want any candy? Oh, you raised your hand. Why don't you take one? That's a good choice because you're going to have to share it with everybody here. 
Ah, I don't know how that little pack of M&Ms is going to go everywhere, but anybody out here want candy? <laughs> oh, I see somebody important here who's come all the way from Chicago, and she's played oboe for us. Would you like, would you like a piece of candy? Sure. No. <laughs> these, these are mine. All mine. I know. Here you go. Everybody's happy. Thanks for coming up. What are your hands up for? Do you want candy? And that was kind of mean to take candy away from, from a boy, right? But that's exactly what the Bible verses that we just read were all about, about a guy who had all kinds of sheep, and he loved his sheep, and someone important came, and he wanted to throw a dinner, but instead of taking one of his candies or one of his sheep, he took the one candy away from a person who had only one. King David did that. You're going to hear a lot about King David's sins. Even heroes can be sinners. But he was forgiven his great sin. The thing is, we are to share with people. So we're going to try and share with you very quickly because there's a bunch of you. Here we go. And we hope that you will enjoy the candy and that you will remember that there is a God who wants to be generous to you and forgive you. Thanks for coming up. Please rise for the Alleluia. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Your words, O Lord, are spirit and life. You have the words of everlasting life. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the time of the harvest had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized the slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, but they treated them the same way. Finally, he sent his son, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, here is the heir, come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now, when the landowner comes, what will he do with those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. The Gospel of our Lord. Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. A man I will call Bob is one whom I admired. He was a leader in the community and his voice was respected wherever he went. 
because both of us represented sizable institutions in the town. He was on the call committee that brought me to the church I was serving at the time. We found ourselves in many of the same places in that small town frequently, at town celebrations, fundraisers, sports events, school activities. He was a generous man and had a heart for the community. A few years after I had left that community, the bank examiners found that Bob had embezzled more than $50,000 from the bank. He served time in federal prison for his crime. I was crushed that this man whom I had put on a pedestal could have betrayed his community and his family in that way. It was a stark reminder to me that we need to be careful about putting anyone on a pedestal because all humans have clay feet. In our long Old Testament reading for today, we lift up the biggest hero of the Old Testament. To this very day, if you ask a person of the Jewish faith who the greatest king of Israel was, there would be only one name and there would be one name only. It would be King David. Any president or governor in our day would love to have the name recognition and the public approval of King David. Nobody greater before, no one greater since. We Christians stand in that line. We, in our faith ancestors, waited for that one who would come in the line of David, one who would occupy the throne of David. Finally, that one came. His name was Jesus, the son of David, we called him. But wait, have we not forgotten something? Have we not forgotten an episode that any human being would want expunged from the record? Have we forgotten that in one part of his life, King David violated almost every one of the Ten Commandments with his coveting, his lusting after his neighbor's wife, his adultery, his stealing, his killing of an innocent man? Seriously. This guy couldn't get elected dog catcher today in a town overrun by stray mongrels. There is not one politician who would want David's support or his fiduciary gifts. There there is not one soldier who would stand up for David in battle after David had killed one of their own in battle. Things haven't changed much have they? We wonder about King David, and yet we wonder about ourselves. I mean, if I, if I told you some salacious story about a man who spied a beautiful woman, schemed to get her into his bed, and when he found out she was with child, he plotted to have her husband killed. I mean, wouldn't you be thinking 2019? Dateline NBC would be all over this. And at the end of the hour or two of Dateline, we would see King David in his orange jumpsuit, wondering how it had all gone so wrong. Could this be the the same guy who was courageous in battle, killing the giant Goliath with a slingshot when he was only a boy? Could this be the same brilliant military leader, the gifted musician who gave us so many psalms that we yet use today to praise God? Could this be the guy who wrote, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Yep, same guy. And in this Me Too era, we wonder how it is that David could have survived his egregious sins. But we also do not know the mind of God. We do not know God's full intent or purpose in allowing this terribly 
flawed man to remain as leader of his people, the king of Israel. We do know from the written record of David's many successes how he expanded the land of Israel, expanded the influence of Israel over all the known nations of the day. We know that he was a brilliant military commander. He was a wise leader, and he really did love the Lord. But he also knew of his great flaws. Our modern-day Bibles tell us that Psalm 51 was written by David after Nathan confronted him with his sin against Bathsheba, his sin against Uriah, his sin against God himself. We have used most of that psalm in our confession and forgiveness of this day. In that psalm, David knows that he is a sinner in need of mercy, He says that his transgressions are always before him, have gripped his spirit. He knows that that God is justified in passing judgment on him. He knows that laying an animal offering on the altar is not enough. That is not what God wants. God wants a broken and contrite spirit. God wants amendment of life. In spite of his fame and his power, David knew deeply of his great sin. He knew that he stood under the judgment of God. It was good fortune for him. He was under the judgment of a forgiving God. Things haven't changed much, have they? Fast forward 3,000 years, we are still terribly flawed people in need of a forgiving God. The good news for us is that we also have a forgiving God like David had a forgiving God. The greater news for us is that there was one who was sent expressly to be the atonement for our sins. While David was pleading for mercy, we need not plead For we know that Jesus came that we might have mercy and forgiveness. Now, that does not give us license to sin whenever and wherever we want. God expects us yet to live honorable lives in right relationship with God and in right relationship with others. We are to uh, love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. We are not to fall into lust and adultery and stealing and killing. That said, every one of us is going to fail to some degree or other. And when that person who fails has been set up on a pedestal, could be a business or religious leader, an admired community official, when they, when they fail, our hearts sink even as our hearts sink when we think of David's great sins. So many lives and careers have been torpedoed in these last years because of sins not unlike that of King David. Just in this last week, an NBC superstar's name surfaced again because of his sordid behavior. But before we look at the speck in our neighbor's eye, Matthew tells us we need to deal with the logs in our own eyes. We will fail. Perhaps we won't fall quite as far as David into breaking nearly all of the commandments at one time, but we will fail. And we need to be certain that we are dealing with the logs that prevent us from having a pure spirit and pure vision. The good news is this. God forgave David. God sent Jesus. God gives us assurance of forgiveness in this one named Jesus. 
We may have clay feet, but we have hearts that are restored in Christ. Amen. Hymn 801, please rise and sing. for the church, the world, and all those in need. Like David, we all stand in the need of your grace. Make us mindful of the ways in which we are easily distracted and what draws us away from you and your loving embrace. Create in us clean hearts and renew our spirit so that we might be wholeheartedly able and willing to serve you and our neighbors in need. Lord, in your mercy. You gift us with life-giving relationships and the blessings of family and friends. Bless the newly married Garrett and Aaron Ockrey with many years of great joy and the gift of strength found in love poured out for them by your grace. Strengthen the bond of love in each marriage and deepen our commitments in relationships that bring glory to you. Lord, in your mercy. Help us to be good stewards of all that you entrust to our care. As we offer financial commitments for the coming new year, make us joyful givers and offer us generous hearts. Lord, in your mercy. The victims of exploitation too often have no voice in the world. Drive us to seek justice for all who have been abused, harassed, and disadvantaged by those in power over them and help us to serve as advocates. Lord, in your mercy. Many for whom we love and care suffer in mind, body, and spirit. Move us to care for others who need it and be with those who long for healing, including Garrett Ockrey, Jenny Dahlstead, Christina Mesmer, Mel Tollisrud, Ruth Emro, Don Lindgren, and Graham Luck. Lord, in your mercy. We rejoice that we take our place among forgiven sinners of every generation. Join our voices with all who sing your eternal praises, both in this life and the one to follow. Comfort those who grieve, especially the family of Helen Walzer, Dale Mundahl in the loss of Helen, Jim Tackman and Jean Marconette as each grieve the loss of their mothers, and Jeff Cochran in the loss of his brother. Grant them strength and hope in your promises. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers, heal our hearts, and bring us always into your steadfast love, O Lord. We offer these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated as we gather this morning's gifts.
Please rise. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love. Through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Come for all is ready. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. You may be seated.
may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Guard the good treasure entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. Almighty God, bless you with grace, mercy, and peace now and forever. Amen. Amen. as Christ loved us. Thanks be to God.